Hello. Today, I am joined by Siora. Uh, she's a software engineer. Um, I, I'm going to say, before I start saying this, there's so many things I can say about you, so I'm going to try to keep it concise, if possible. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> uh, software engineer, an egghead instructor and learner advocate, technical writer at DigitalOcean, creator of 100 project days, and AWS Community Builder, amongst many, many, and many other things. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How are you yeah, doing I'm today, Sarah? I'm excited to be here. I'm good. I'm good. I'm really excited to be here. Today's a busy day, but this is like the highlight, so I'm happy to be here. Well, I'm glad that you think that this is a highlight. I really <laughs> appreciate you being here and taking the time to speak with me and with us, with the audio. So, yeah. Um, to get us started, I guess the question that I have first is, how was that journey to become a software um, engineer? So you were a digital marketer, a digital yes. marketer, marketeer, marketeer, sorry, <laughs> um, and then software engineer. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so this is like, this is gonna, I'm gonna try to keep this story short. Every time I tell this story, it's like super long. So I, uh, I've been interested in tech since I was like 12. Uh, I didn't really know coding was a thing until then. Uh, I like one of my teachers when I was in sixth grade played a video um, and it was like Bill Gates and a bunch of like basketball players and a couple other, I think maybe Mark Zuckerberg was in the video too. And they were like talking about okay. the power of coding and they were like, oh, like coding is like the next big thing, everyone should learn how to code. And I kind of was like, oh, that sounds kind of cool. But then I forgot about it. I didn't like return hmm. to it again until I was a junior in high school. Um, I was like trying to figure out what I was going to do, like what are, what's going to be my next career step, like all this kind of stuff. Um, and I met someone who was a software, she was a software engineer or IT professional, I should say. And she kind of was telling me about what the tech industry was like. And I was like, oh, I think I could do that. And again, I kind of just left it on the back burner. I didn't really pursue it like seriously um, until I had just, just graduated from high school and I was accepted into this um, program called Code with Colossi. It's a, like a nonprofit in the US where uh, mm -hmm. they have these two week camps where in the summer where they teach girls how to code. So I did that and it was really fun. It was really hard. We had to build a website with HTML, CSS and Ruby and okay. I didn't know what I was doing, but we pulled something <laughs> together. Like it just worked. Um, and then I was like, oh, this is really cool. Like, I think I really want to do this now. Like that was my first taste of coding. And I was like, I think I could do this. Um, but I, at that point, I wasn't like enrolled in a university. That wasn't like a real option for me. So mm -hmm. I was like, okay, the only thing I can see myself doing is a boot camp, and boot camps are really expensive. I didn't have any money. Like I was like, I don't know how I'm going to pull this off. So I ended up just kind of like self teaching, I guess. I did like free code camp. I like bought like a course or two on Udemy and never finished them. Like was super inconsistent, started then stopped and started and stopped. Um, and I somehow like stumbled into digital marketing. A friend of mine was just starting a business and she was like, I need somebody to help with digital marketing. So I like joined her and I just kind of picked it up from YouTube videos and stuff. So. I was like doing the digital marketing in the software, like learning to be a software developer at the same time, but I ended up getting sidetracked. I, got, I started to focus more on uh, digital marketing because that's just where my career was taking me. Uh, and then I ended up doing like freelance digital marketing. I was pretty, I was okay at it. Like I wasn't the best, but <laughs> I could like pull some strings together with some things with digital marketing. Um, and then, uh, so where am I now? This is such a long story. I feel like I, I just make it longer than it has to be. So it's fine. Fast forward. <laughs> so fast forward. So while I'm doing the digital marketing, the whole time, I still have coding on the back burner. So I would like mm -hmm. return to, I would return to uh like free code camp and my Udemy courses, and then get distracted again, and return, and then get distracted again. Like it was super inconsistent, and somehow I would go months without coding, and then have to relearn CSS and JavaScript like all over again. Um, and then here comes coronavirus in March of 2020. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I was doing, I was doing digital marketing full, like full time as a freelancer. 
and I lost every single one of my clients. Every Oof. single one of them dropped me. So I was like, okay, I have no choice now but to take this coding thing seriously. Like this is literally my only option. And I had just got accepted into Udacity. They have a scholarship for their um, cloud DevOps program. So I just got accepted to, into that. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna like go hard and just totally immerse myself in this. So the past like six months have been more jam packed than that whole year before that, where I was like trying to learn how to code. I've like, I feel like I've put a lot of pressure on myself cause it's like, I wasted all that time. I have to like make it back. So, <laughs> so since then I've been a little, like I've mostly focused on AWS and cloud computing. Um, but I also have like some experience teaching HTML, CSS, JavaScript, um, a little experience with React. I love Python. I don't get to work with Python as much as I would like, but it's like literally my favorite language. Um, and I know a little bit about databases and stuff like that. So I'm a little bit like all of, I have a lot of knowledge. Well, I should say I have a little bit of knowledge in a lot of different things. Um, and you could probably tell that from all the, like I'm pretty all over the place, but yeah, so since then, since March, uh, that's when I started uh, after March, I think in April, I started working with Egghead. Um, and then I had a couple like speaking engagements between then. Um, I started writing a lot more too after March. I think March is when I first released like a blog post that was not through a company I was working for. Um, and then yeah, and then I started working with DigitalOcean as a technical writer in September. So yeah, it's been a it's been like a it's been a crazy year. Like there's been some career wise, this is the best I've ever done, but year wise, this has been a pretty trash year. So <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's it's interesting. Sometimes when everything seems to go wrong, some for some reason things start falling in place and start going well for <laughs> yeah. you, and it's like. It shouldn't be happening, but you know, I'm happy yeah. that it's happening. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I think I remember you joined uh, Party Corgi in January, March. Uh, I don't know. I remember, I think we joined more or less around the same yeah. time, I, I, I believe so. And yeah. um, I saw then that you got into Egghead and you became an instructor. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. So yeah, <laughs> congratulations for that. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I really enjoy teaching and I get nervous when I have to do it because I'm like, I don't know what's going on either, but uh, it's something that I really enjoy. And it, like when you teach others, you in turn teach yourself. So that's been kind yep. of like my own learning technique is like, if I'm gonna learn something, I have to teach somebody else, whether it's through an egg hit lesson or through a blog post or whatever the case may be. That's like my new routine is like, I'm gonna learn this, but I'm also gonna write a blog post about it, so yeah. Which is what they say, if you want to see if you actually know something, try to teach it and then you will know exactly the things that you don't know, yes. <laughs> if, if that makes yes. sense. And yeah. um, because I started with Python, Python also has a special place in my heart. So I was quite happy when I saw your lessons on Python on Egghead and I was like, yeah. yes, it's not just a React <laughs> and JavaScript. Yeah, yeah. So, I still have yeah. a lot of a lot more Python content that I need to put out there. It's just a matter of like making time for it. But Python is literally like, I really, sh I think that's another reason why I was super inconsistent because JavaScript was like hard for me. Like I mm -hmm. didn't understand what was going on. It just was like confusing to me. And I, and it was because I had so many questions and now I understand like some of the reasons why I was confused, but I just didn't get like, okay, how, how come JavaScript runs in the browser and other languages don't? Like I was just so confused about all those things. Um, and it would like stop me and then I would have to learn all over again. And then I would get confused again. Like, oh, what is DOM manipulation? So instead of like continuing to fail at JavaScript, <laughs> I decided to just try something new and Python is pretty relevant in the, the cloud computing world. So I was like, okay, let me try Python out. And when I tried it out, it was like a match made in heaven. Like I love Python. Um, and now, now that I know a little bit of Python, um, returning back to JavaScript, I feel like I understand JavaScript a little bit better. I understand like what's going on a little more. And plus I read more and I ask more questions now. So I, I'm not as confused as I used to be, but yeah, Python is just like it. I just get it. Like, I just understand what's happening and it doesn't need like much explanation for me. I love Python. Yeah, I think 
so when I when I was starting, I started with the three big ones that existed in Code Academy, which was uh, mm -hmm. Python, JavaScript, and Ruby. And I actually started with JavaScript, and I was like, "What the hell is happening here?" <laughs> um, and then I started Python, and I was like, "Ah, huh, okay, yeah, that makes sense." And I sort of feel that I had the same experience as you. After understanding Python and after getting deeper into Python, then I started learning the basics, and then I moved to JavaScript. Um, I think it's two years now. Damn, time goes by so fast. I know. I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I was like, oh, okay. So in Python, I do it this way. So in JavaScript, I do it in that way, and things start falling in place. And I was yeah. like, huh, okay, that's very interesting. So is that why you have a love-hate relationship with JavaScript? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, 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 yes. I feel like now it's like now that I spent some time away from JavaScript and I'm like because of a lot of the technical writing I do has to do with JavaScript. I have to like explain some of the weird stuff that's going on with JavaScript. And uh, now that I'm coming back, I feel like I understand it a little bit more now and I kind of know what's going on. But I used to really, I feel like I'm just now starting to get it. And this is after like me learning it like a year and a half ago, two years ago. Uh, and I'm just now starting to like, okay, I kind of know what's going on now, kind of. Um, there are still things that I can't, I don't understand and I can't explain, but I'm definitely better off than I was. So I definitely would say that it's, it's for sure like the essence of a love-hate relationship. Like I do love <laughs> how easy it is to like, build something really quick and build something that's cool and that you can interact with like that's awesome but also like once you get to a certain point and you're trying to do more advanced things it's like what is happening here what's going on so i'm starting to kind of figure out what's going on in the more advanced side of things but my my knowledge of javascript is very like like i'm just now starting to put all the puzzle pieces together like i've jumped around a lot mm -hmm. and i learned advanced things when i probably shouldn't have so I'm like just now, oh, now I get what's happening. Now I understand what that is. Like I'm just at that point now after like two years. So yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I had someone on one of my streams and that person said, you know, I tried to learn JavaScript and that person didn't know what to get started with. And he said, do you know what? I feel that if I learn this specific thing in JavaScript, maybe... I don't know, Gatsby, in two years, Gatsby is going to disappear and then I have to relearn everything again. And I was like, well, probably in two years, Gatsby is not going to disappear, but <laughs> you are still learning JavaScript or you're still practicing React. So those skills are transferable. But it is true, yeah. when you are starting and you have no idea where to start, if you don't have this guide, it's like, there's so many things to learn. Uh, maybe I'm learning about DOM and that's a rabbit hole itself. And it's a little bit yes, more advanced stuff, which <laughs> I made that mistake in as well. So yeah, I can totally relate to that. <laughs> yeah, I. it's funny. I had taken a class, like some bootcamp was like offering like advanced JavaScript class. And I took it because I was like, I know what's going on. Like I know JavaScript. And I definitely struggled. Like it was like a, I think the class lasted for like a month and it was, we had classes on like Mondays and Wednesday evenings and I would be so lost. Like I had no clue what was going on. And that's because it was way far advanced than what I like was ready for at the time. But now when I think back about like some of the things that I learned then I'm like, okay, now after like six months, I finally understand what's happening. And like, yeah, what you said about, um, about jumping around a lot, like that's another thing I did too. Like I, yeah, it's so much out there. It's easy to get distracted. Um, and sometimes, like, even now, I've seen a lot of people talking about Next.js, and I'm like, oh, I want to try that. Like, that seems interesting. But I'm trying to, like, control myself because there are other things that I have to learn that are more relevant to me right now. Um, but it's, it's like, that's, like, a such a big pitfall that I think a lot of us confront when you're just starting out. It's like, oh, maybe I should learn this. And then each thing that you decide to focus on has a million and like a million and one different directions you can go in. even python there's so much you can do mm -hmm. with python it's so hard to like just focus on one particular thing and like stay on that path and i think the like i'm varying away from cloud computing now and i'm varying away from aws now but the thing i'm thankful for is that at that point in time in march when i got that scholarship it gave me enough focus to get 
to us like an advanced enough point where if I moved on, I would understand what was going on instead of just like jumping around. So it was like a clear path that I was going to take that I was going to like stick with. And that really helped like spur on my growth. I think that but that's one thing that really like helped motivate me to like keep going and, and stay consistent. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it's um, especially when you're self-taught, there's so many things that you have to learn. There's so many things that seem shiny and there's so many things that seem interesting and yeah. so many fields that you can say, oh, I think cybersecurity might be cool. And then you go into that rabbit hole and then you keep on going and you're like, oh, wait, but I should maybe do some websites because I should have a portfolio or something. Yes, and then, yeah. oh, yeah, this uh, everybody's using AWS. Let me learn AWS. And then you are like learning for a full department <laughs> because it's what you said. If you're a self-taught, it's very hard to focus, Yeah. Um, which it seems in your case, that scholarship was a thing that really said, all right, here's a clear path. It might not be what you want to do in the future, which is, that's going to be my next question, but it might not be what you want to do in the future, but it could be something to say, okay, I have like a specialization and then I can learn a few other things just for the sake of learning. Right. So going with that, do you want to be a DevOps world engineer kind of thing or you have no idea yet? <laughs> so I, mm. I, there are certain things I really, really like about cloud. I like... Uh, and some of them are not necessarily like super techie. Like I do like the fact that um, like the JavaScript world, there's so many JavaScript developers and there's so many people who are into React and those kind of things, but there aren't that many people who are like, I'm a cloud person or I'm a DevOps person. So you can kind of like set yourself apart that way. But uh, DevOps and cloud are like, they're very tedious sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and also sometimes the fact that there aren't that many people who are involved in that space means that when you have issues, it's harder to find help. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I've had tons of those, like some of the assignments I had for that scholarship were like, what is happening right now? So I can't say that I particularly enjoy, especially DevOps. I can't say that I particularly enjoy DevOps. Um, even though I do appreciate, again, I appreciate the role that the, the scholarship played in like my whole journey in tech. I do think I'm going to stick with cloud because I think cloud and the serverless is like a really big deal right now. And I think even personally, like when you're building projects, having cloud and serverless on your side means that you can build things that like before, like would usually take lots of time and maybe even a whole team. So I'm going to stick with cloud, I think, I think. Um, but as far as like what next steps are for me, I, I really, um, and this is another thing with cloud and, and DevOps is that you, it's not, it's a lot of scripting. It's not so much coding. Like you do a lot mm -hmm. of like YAML or things like that, cloud formation scripts and stuff. And I'm not, I don't really enjoy that so much. Like it's, it's not my cup of tea. I really like the, the problem solving and the, how do I get this, this feature to work or how do I implement this new like code syntax or whatever? That's, that's what I really enjoy. And I discovered that when I was doing, the cloud DevOps program, I was like, I kind of miss coding, like actually like coding. Um, so I think that's something I would be leaning more towards. Um, but whatever I do, I think the the things that I enjoy most are really, I really like content creation and I really like community building and I like to code. So anything that allows me to kind of like combine all those things is like kind of what I want to go for. So, yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. And, you know, I heard your um, episode on... I forgot the name on uh, the AWS um, podcast. Oh, screaming in the cloud. Yes, that's the one. I, I couldn't remember the name. And um, one thing that uh, the host said was, you know, there's so many things that you can do just on AWS alone that um, you definitely can't get tired of learning new things just on that field anyway. Yes. And um, okay. yeah, I, I think I agree with you or I agree with you. DevOps can be very tedious. That's why you should automate all the things. And that's why automate, yes. uh, autom I never know how to say this word. Uh, automation? Autom automation? Automation? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's such a big thing in DevOps world because yes. it's like, I don't want to write this damn script every single time. Or I don't want to deal with the, the same sort of YAML configuration all the time. So, yeah. Just out of yeah, curiosity. When you deal with YAML, how annoying are the spaces? 
<laughs> I know, right? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I'm like having nightmares now. I'm like, oh, flashback. Some of it, some of those assignments were like, what is happening right now? Oh, yep. my goodness. It's like, and then, and when you create, like, when you're doing like infrastructure as code, it's really confusing because you can't really visualize what's going on sometimes like because the the cloud stuff is literally like you can't see it like especially when you're dealing with someone else's servers that you're supposed to be like configuring or whatever so i had a really hard time like okay i don't know what order these things go in i don't know how to like list this this service and provision that server and all this kind of stuff because i don't i can't see it so that was like a really difficult thing for me and i'm a very like for certain things, I'm a very visual learner and I need to like see what's happening to understand what's going mm -hmm. on. So I was like, I, so that part of it is like, uh, that's, that's another part of it that I was like, I don't know if I'm a huge fan of this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, I'm not going to abandon AWS on like cloud completely, but I don't know if that's, if I want to be like, I'm going to be a cloud engineer. Like, I don't know if that's exactly what I want to do. I know site re reliability engineering is kind of like you do a little bit of both. You code a little bit and you do the, the like server stuff and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, that, that might be an option in the future. I'm really like, as far as like future plans, I really think that the thing I most want to go for is developer advocacy or developer relations, because I feel like it, combines a lot of what I know I like to do um, together in one role. So right now, like doing technical writing, I get paid to do technical writing, but all the, the writing I do outside of that is like just my own free time. And it's hard to make time for that. And I, but I enjoy it so much that it's something I want to keep doing or like video content creation. Like those are things I want to keep doing, but in DevRel, that's all your time is spent on. So I kind of want to do something like that. And like right now, if I do a talk, that's my personal time that's being devoted mm -hmm. to that. And it's hard to fit all those things into one. And, but I like it so much, I still want to do it. So uh, I'm thinking that dev advocacy or dev relations is like maybe the next thing I want to go for. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what happens. <laughs> I think it's, it's hard. Uh, on one of the interviews that I've done, the person that was interviewing me asked, oh, so what are your long-term goals in tech? And I'm like, I don't know. I want to deal with code. I, I have no yeah. idea. And it was clearly the wrong answer. And I've, I've told that story before, but yeah, it's like I'm applying for a junior position. I can say maybe I want to be a full stack developer because I've been doing back end stuff and front end stuff, but I'm not sure if that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. You know, yeah. but it's, it's hard. And when when there's so many things and you just enjoy learning and practicing and it's what you said, there's so many things. It's like, maybe I want to do this thing with cloud for a bit and then I don't deal with that or I, I couldn't enjoy it as much. So now I'm going to do this thing. And, you know, and I think nowadays you don't really have a career for life. It's very easy for you to just jump roles from one thing and another and in tech, there's so many roles available that you don't yeah. have to stay branded as backend developer, period. Unless this is what gives you pleasure and that's it. So it's, uh, yeah, it's it's hard to say this is the thing I want to do and I'm not going to do anything else. That's yeah, another totally thing. I totally understand what you mean. Yeah. And um, that's another thing that Kevin said. We should try to all to try to become a T-shaped developer, which is, you know, a little bit of everything, but then you specialize in the few little things. So then you sort of yeah. become a T-shaped developer, which I really like that analogy. So it makes so a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I yeah. think I think that's like the beauty of the tech industry is that there's so much it's it's like it's it's like a, a blessing and a curse, right? Like there's so much out there. So if you do feel like oh, I don't think I like this so much, there's always something that's pretty adjacent that you can jump to. That's not far-fetched. That won't be super difficult for you. But also it means that it's super hard to focus and like stay on one thing and kind of like focus on that. Mm -hmm. But I think the more, once you kind of like get good at one thing, like you become a really strong backend developer, a really strong like Python developer. Then once you have those kind of skills, it's much easier to jump around. It's almost like learning a language, right? Like if you, mm -hmm. if you learn to, if you have 
two languages learned. The next one is going to be easier. The next one is going to be easier. So that's kind of how I look at it. Like, uh, you know, if you're, I learned Spanish in high school and I really took it seriously. I'm like, I'm going to really learn this and become fluent. And it was hard. Like the first language to learn is like super, super hard and difficult. And I didn't know what's going on. But once I got that down pat, now the next one is going to be easier. The next one after that is going to be easier. And that's kind of how I look at it in tech. Like it's going to be hard to focus the first like year or two. Like it's going to be yeah. hard to find that thing that you want to stick with. And that even though you hate it, sometimes you're just going to like try to get good at it. But once you do get through that and you get to a certain level where you know what's going on, once you decide to jump around and do whatever, it's going to be much easier. So that's how I keep, that's what I keep trying to remind myself, like stick to one thing right now, <laughs> get pretty good at it. And then you can move on to whatever else you want after that. So. But this is what people say, uh, learn the basics very well first before jumping around, unless you're jumping around just to see what kind of language you like best. But yeah, like you said, you found Python, Python made sense. And then you learn basics from that. Is you talk about languages, so are you still trying to achieve your dream of becoming a polyglot? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's so funny. Okay, so I still really want to become a polyglot. When I was like 15, I was like, I'm going to learn six languages and I'm going to travel the world. But this year, I've been like pretty focused on like tech stuff. So I haven't been, I think, I think my next language though is going to be Portuguese. I have this weird routine of like every morning I wake up I do my little morning routine and I listen to YouTube videos in a bunch of different languages. Like mm -hmm. I listen to YouTube videos in English, Spanish, French, Italian, and Korean. And I do that to kind of train my ears to like at least get used to the listen. sound. Yep. So at least when I decide to start learning a language, I'll have that like, cause you know, a kid spends like their first two years not talking. And if you count in the womb, it's almost three years. Right. Mm -hmm. And they just listen. So that's what I'm doing right now. I'm just like listening. I'm trying to pick up the noises. So whatever one I do decide to learn, it's just that I have to like, again, get to a certain level of proficiency with the tech stuff so that I can focus on other things. Cause I'm pretty, I'm almost fluent in Spanish. Almost like if I try hard enough, I think I could be fluent. Um, so the next language I learn, I want to be able to de dedicate like a, a nice amount of time so I can really learn it well. Cause I don't like doing stuff and not like doing it well. Like I don't mm -hmm. want to learn a language and just like know a little bit of Portuguese or a little bit of French. I want to like know the language. So, so yeah, I'm not as far ahead as I thought. I thought by now I would like know like six languages. I'm definitely not there yet. Hey, but you still have still plenty like of time. Right, <laughs> you still have yeah, plenty of time, dream. it's fine. It's and if you need idea. help with Portuguese, let me know, I can help you. So it's fine. <laughs> cool, cool, okay. Awesome, but I think yeah. if you know Spanish, you probably will be able to pick up Portuguese uh, slightly easier. Um, yeah. I think as well, Italian might be a little bit easier than Portuguese, but you know, they are quite similar, the three languages. So I can go around with Spanish, but I don't say I speak Spanish because I speak a mixture of Portuguese and Spanish, <laughs> which we call in Portugal, Portugal. And um, <laughs> with Italian, I used to be better because I was living with Italian people and I used to practice, okay. but now I don't really practice, so I kind of lost. And that's one thing with languages. If you don't practice, it just goes I very know. quickly. It's, it's uh, very yeah. time consuming, but I think my little YouTube routine in the morning helps. <laughs> like, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, it, I actually learned it. So, oh my goodness. Now I'm about to get really nerdy because I'm like a language That's nerd. fine. <laughs> so I was like obsessed with polyglots. And I used to watch all these videos of these guys who like spoke like 20 different languages and stuff like that. And I would like watch their videos of how they explain how they study and how they keep up with it. And like some of them would say like, uh, one thing, which is a method I want to try is like, I was born speaking English and my second language was Spanish. My third language was French, but I learned French from Spanish. So you get to practice your Spanish while you're learning French. And then if you decide to learn Chinese next, you'll learn Chinese from French. So that's something I've thought about doing. Um, but one of the things they mentioned was like, they have this routine of like regularly taking in the language. So like they'll watch the news in Spanish watch cooking shows in French, like those kind of things. So they, they get accustomed to hearing the language because that's like a big part of it. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do that. Like I don't have international TV, but I have YouTube. So I'm going to use that. Um, and I find that like French is a little hard for me to understand, but Italian and, and Portuguese, 
I can pretty much listen and like know what's going on. Like mm -hmm. I'll be like, oh yeah, without having to watch the video, I'll know that like yeah, she's yeah. putting on her makeup or that he's cooking or whatever <laughs> the case may be. So yeah, it's like it's one of my favorite things, and I get really nerdy when I talk about it. <laughs> and it's I wish fun. I was like around more people who like in my area there aren't that many people who speak different languages. Like there are different sections of Philadelphia where there's like is very diverse, but not my area. And mm -hmm. nobody in my family speaks a different language, which I really hate. I'm like, I need everybody to learn how to speak Spanish so you can speak with me and we can <laughs> practice together. Um, but yeah, it's still like one of my my biggest hobbies. And I and I hope that like one day I can reach that like six fig that six number and like know all those languages and be able to travel and like talk to people and have fun. But like post corona, that's definitely something yeah. I'm gonna try to do. I'm gonna try to travel around and speak Italian and speak French here and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Sounds like a good uh, good uh, goal to try to achieve. Um, yeah, yeah. Or if you can't achieve six languages, spoken languages, maybe you can do six languages as in coding languages. That's true. I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm, get, I'm actually getting there fast. With, uh, See? With every, it seems like every day I'm like, uh, especially with technical writing, because sometimes I have to write about languages I don't really know about. Like TypeScript was TypeScript is technically kind of like JavaScript, but not. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to count that as a separate language. But I, it's like every day I'm like, oh man, this seems kind of cool. Am I going to learn this too? Like, is this going to be added to my little portfolio of languages that I know now? I'm trying to like, but again, I'm trying to stay focused. It's hard because everything is interesting to me. Like. Even earlier, you mentioned cybersecurity. I went through a phase where I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to do cybersecurity. I want to hack people. And then I even went through like a blockchain phase, which is like, I'm so ashamed of. Like, I really got into that. And I was like, <laughs> crypto seems so cool. Like, I've been through all of that. And, uh, but I think um, web development and like plus cloud is kind of what I want to stick with now. I think that could change. Like, talk to me two months from now yep. and it could be totally different. <laughs> but that's what I want now. <laughs> Which makes sense. So, what do you think? It's uh, so. What's your opinion on learning in public? How important is it for people? Because you know, sometimes when I speak with junior developers, or when I speak with someone that's trying to get into coding, I would say just create a blog post, or just create a blog, write posts about it, and it will help people in the future. And this is one thing that folks at um, Party Corgi keep saying, just like, just put it in writing because you will help someone in the future. Yeah. And I think that's, that's another thing that I think is why I've been able to progress the way I have is because, well, first of all, I'm the kind of person who needs external motivation to get things done. I am not the kind of person who can say like, Oh, I'm going to like, I'm going to code every day for an hour and like only I know about it and I'm going to do it because I am super self motivated I'm not that person like at all. So the only way for me to get things done is if other people know about it. And I know that they're waiting for a blog post or they're waiting for me to finish this project. And I know that people are watching and they're like, oh yeah, I'm super excited about this project you're building. So that will kind of motivate me to at least not forget about what I'm, what my goals are. So I'm a huge, huge proponent of, of learning in public. That's like, uh, I think it's super important. No matter, even if you decide like, oh, I want to be a generalist and I want to know a little bit about everything. Like that's totally fine too. That could be the, the path you want to take. But I think learning in public and putting those things that you, you, you're learning out there and, and solidifying it in your own mind and writing about it or making a video about it or whatever you decide to do it helps other people of course but i think it helps you so much like even if if i write a blog that nobody reads about like it's totally fine because to, for me to write that i had to learn a whole lot to be able to write about it like mm -hmm. there are lots of things i know but i can't explain it so do i really know it and i think when you learn in public it kind of helps you to get to that point like learning through teaching is like a, a great way to really no, do I really understand what's happening here? Or am I just like going, am I just following the instructions? So uh, it's it's something that I really love and I'm, I'm trying to embed it in my like learning routine even more. Like my new thing is if I'm building a project while I'm building it, I also have a markdown file where I'm writing down everything that I'm doing. Like so that I can write down, like have the steps outlined, create the blog post and like put it out there so people can read. And also I can reference later if I decide to build the same thing again and I don't know what I'm doing. 
Um, so I think it's like a super great thing to to kind of put into your routine of learning. Um, and I, I know it's like nerve wracking for some people, but it has helped me a ton. Like you don't even know. <laughs> yeah, I think one one of the most or the worst thing is when you try to put things out there and you have these gatekeepers where they say you shouldn't be writing about that because you don't have your 10 years experience, yada, 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 which, yeah, sure, you have 10 years experience, but can you explain me how to do a list comprehension in Python? And the guy or the person will say, yeah, sure, you have to do it this way. And I was like, yeah, I still don't understand it because I never seen right. it in my life. So you can't relate with someone that's starting. That's why, you know, people are going to complain. People are going to say that it sucks. It's fine. It's what you say. I'm doing for myself. If some, I can help someone else in the future, that's perfect. I am just want yeah. to put stuff out there. And I'm not sure if I am wrong in assuming this, but I think you are similar to me where you start lots of new things to just learn and to get started although there's yeah. a huge a huge difference between you and me which is you actually finish stuff and mine are stayed oh. somewhere and that's it <laughs> do i finish stuff though i definitely don't finish stuff. i have i have so many projects in the works that are like just sitting there looking at me waiting for me to finish them and uh but but i'm i'm like i keep lying to myself and saying i'm going to finish this one day like but there's one project I'm working on right now that I'm super hype about. And I have like, mm -hmm. I really want to finish this because it's like, it's, it says everything about me in one project. I'm building a meme API. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm like learning a lot along the way and I hope to finish it soon. And I want it to be basically almost like searchable so that, uh, like connected to a front end so that I can like search a phrase and like get the perfect meme to fit mm -hmm. what I'm looking for. Because I, right now all my memes <laughs> are just in a folder on my phone. And if I'm looking for like, I want a cat meme right now, I have to like search through and like sometimes I miss the meme I'm looking for. So I want to be able to make it searchable and we'll see if that happens. <laughs> but like I'm learning so much about API building and schemas and all that kind of stuff right now. So hopefully I'll get that done soon. It's like the next big thing that I'm working on. And then I have other things I have to return to that like, I'm going to get done. I promise I'm going to get it done. But but yeah, it's like, I don't know. I love, I think project building and learning in public are like the two things that if, if you want to learn how to code, those are things you should start doing early and mm -hmm. often. Um, because it even if you don't finish a project, you still gain so much from doing that. Like, it's, it's something about practical knowledge that is just different. Like me learning and reading about it is totally different than me actually doing it. So that's why I'm like, all right, project building, learning in public are, are the two things that I'm like focusing on right now. If I want to learn something new, I have to build a project and I have to write about it. Like those are the two things that I'm like are part of my routine now that um, I'm hoping are going to have good results. <laughs> we'll see. I think so, though. I think so. I mean, you are progressing, so I'm sure that you will get something from that. You know, I, on lockdown, so in March till June, I guess, uh, April, May, whatever it was, time was a blur. Uh, I created yeah. this, yeah, <laughs> I created this thumbs up news project, which I created a, or I followed a Twitter classifier tutorial. And I thought, you know what, it might be really cool to try to get the same thing, classify headlines and just get positive headlines. And I've learned a crap load from that project. Yeah. I haven't done anything with it. I have an idea of creating a um, way for you to subscribe to or to register and then you can subscribe and use the API, which I started adding stuff and then I just like, oh, another shiny thing. I'm going to go that way now, <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, that's how it is. Um, so if you start so many things and you have so many things at the same time, how do you manage your time? Do you have like a special sauce that you can share? <laughs> I'm really bad at time management. I don't know yeah. if I'm the person you should ask, but the one thing that helps me a ton is the Pomodoro technique. Mm -hmm. I swear that is the, 
only way I get anything done ever. And like, if I finish something, it's because of the Pomodoro technique, which is basically 25 minutes working, five minute break. And I'm a, a huge procrastinator, like a lot of people, but it's a huge problem for me. And the Pomodoro technique kind of helps me get over that, uh, get over those yucky feelings you have when you know there's something you have to do, but you really don't want to do it. Um, so I really use the Pomodoro technique. But other than that, like I, I think sometimes I use projects as a way to procrastinate on finishing another project. So I'm not the, the person to ask about time <laughs> management at all. But if I get anything done, it's because of the Pomodoro technique. I don't, I actually probably need more tips from other people about time management because I'm not good at it at all. And it's starting to get to the point where I'm like, okay, somebody needs to like get this schedule in check because yeah, I'm just not good with time management. I'm, I'm, I need to get better desperately, but yeah, if you have this, tips, I'm totally open <laughs> to hearing them. <laughs> well, so this is one thing that I want to do with the podcast or the website for the podcast is to write a bit more about the soft skills and it's going to include some time management stuff. Um, I've tried the Pomodoro technique, but I was struggling sometimes. So my brain works a bit weird. Sometimes it's like, let's do all the things. Other times it's like, nope. Um, so yeah. when it's on this, let's do all the things um, drive or mode, I, if I start the Pomodoro technique, I really find it distracting when I have to take a break. I'm like, no, I need to keep on working. Okay. <laughs> but when I am procrastinating, that really helps because I'm like, it's just 20 minutes. It's fine. I will, I can do 20 minutes and then it, it kind of gets me started. Yeah. And then after a while, I just ignore it. The thing that helps me, and this is one thing that I've been trying to get back to because I've been on holidays and my habits and routines are just gone. <laughs> <laughs> As you do, you know, um, yeah. is the night before, I tend to take at least half an hour to write the, a to-do list of things that I want to do the next day. And then when I wake up, I look at them and I see if it still applies. And then I try to say from all of these things that I want to do, what's the top priority, three top priorities. And I start working on that first. That's what usually helps me. Another thing that helps me is I have a bullet journal and I oh, cool. try to divide my... Um, my days so I can even show you I'm not sure if it's going to be able to see that much but can you see oh well yeah, yeah. so each each uh, square is a hour and I color code this hour so sometimes when everything is red because red is um, it's the it's I use red when I am wasting time <laughs> or when I'm playing games and I see the whole day yeah. red on my Ah, crap, I need to work tomorrow as hard yeah. as hell. Um, that sort of tends to help, but it's it's a habit and it's a routine. Like I said, I had three weeks off and I just didn't do anything. And, and sometimes yeah. it's fine. Sometimes you need to have rest yeah. because when yeah. you're creating so many things, it's it's very easy to get burned out. So that's another thing you need to have a look. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I actually really need to start doing the 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 method you were just talking about of like mm -hmm. writing things down and then the next morning you look at your list. I am also very inconsistent with that. I've tried that before and it worked wonders and then I just stopped doing it. I'm that's probably my biggest problem is inconsistency. It's really hard for me to like do something like every day like I'm supposed to. But I'm gonna try to do that again because I found that like right now there's so many things lying for my attention. And it's hard to give them to the right thing. <laughs> so, yeah. so I've been like struggling with that a little. I probably would say that's like one of the biggest struggles. Like when I first, first was getting like back started, probably like in March, the biggest thing was probably like imposter syndrome. But right now it's time mm -hmm. management. I'm really bad at that. Like it's, it's really not funny. Like it's, it's a shame. <laughs> it's really bad. And then I do this thing where I hyper focus on things. Like sometimes if I start reading a book that's really good, I have to finish it. Or if I start yep. watching a TV show, I have to finish the whole show. The I have to know what's going to happen next. So if I'm doing that while I have a, whole, a long list of responsibilities that need to be met, they're not going to get done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, and it's very hard for me to kind of snap myself out of that mindset, like put the book down or stop watching the TV show and get your work done. 
Um, so that means that usually I try to reserve the weekends for stuff like that. Like I mm -hmm. try to just stick to weekends for watching TV shows and I can binge watch a TV show in a weekend pretty easily, but I can't do it on the week on, on a weekday because I have stuff I need to do and I will yeah. not get it done. I guarantee you, I will not get it done if I have a good TV show that I'm watching. So that's like one thing I'm trying to like start doing to kind of help with that because it's so bad. Like the way I just ignore my responsibilities is like, <laughs> I, it's really crazy. I can't, I can't believe I do that, but I do, I do. And I'm working on it, but I'm going to use your tip. Yeah, one thing that I want to start doing, uh, or I want to start becoming more consistent, is something that I've uh, seen uh, on a video from Tim Ferriss. He says that okay. he does things in batches and he schedules it on his calendar those days for that particular batch. So let's say that Monday the 15th, all I'm going to do is write and that's it. I'm not going to revise, I'm not going to um, code, just writing day. You're going to be exhausted at the end of the day, but you don't have that context switch, so then it tends to mm. help. And then the next day, uh, just do revising all of this stuff that you wrote. And then the next day, do a course, or the next day, do this or do that. And that's one thing that I've been trying to do, is to trying to just say, okay, this day I'm going to allocate the whole time for this particular thing. It works. I just haven't got into the habit of doing that doing constantly and yeah, consistently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. But, I'll have to try that. I think that'll actually work because I do feel like um I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but sometimes I'll like finish writing an article and I'm like, wow, that was so amazing. And now I'm gonna just take off for the rest of the day. Like I'm not gonna yep. do anything for the rest of the day. And that's another thing. Like I get so excited when I finish. I just finished this project, so I'm just gonna like relax for the rest of the day, knowing I have a whole lot of things I need to do. So probably if I try that, it'll probably work out a lot better for me. <laughs> but yeah, I feel like uh, yeah, that's probably the biggest thing that I'm like I need to work on, and I need to work on it fast because it's gonna start affecting my performance at work, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> if I don't get it under wraps, um, yeah. Which I think that's the risk that you, um, English hard. <laughs> uh, that's that's a risk that you. Let me try to rephrase that. That's something that can happen <laughs> when you have your to do list with prioritization. Because let's say that you have twenty things on your list, and you only have two high uh, prioritized uh, tasks. Yeah. You take those two and it's like, okay, I'm going to have a break now. So you have to keep on like forcing yourself to keep on yeah. going. And I yeah. do exactly the same thing as you. So I think it's, yeah, um, yeah it's, it's normal to do that. So you yeah, said it's that hard to keep you, the momentum. Yeah. <laughs> you said that you struggle with imposter syndrome, which I think it's something that we've all dealt. And um, even now, I still do. Streaming helped me, and we were talking about that before we went live, that you should start streaming if you had the time for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, how did you surpass that? Or Okay, so <laughs> I don't know if I've, tech if I've actually surpassed it, because mm -hmm. uh, I still feel like, oh, I kind of snuck my way in here, and people just didn't realize. Like, I still feel that way a lot of the time. But the difference is that now... I don't necessarily let it stop me. Mm -hmm. um, I have a story to tell and I hate this story because it makes me so mad at myself. But when I was first learning to code like a year and a half ago, um, there was a company in Philadelphia that was hiring for an internship in the summer. And I applied for it and I got like an interview. They were going to interview me and then we were going to do a technical challenge. And I got so nervous about it. I like canceled. I like emailed the lady like, I'm sick. I can't make it. Like, I don't think I can do this. I'm really sick. And she was like, oh, can we reschedule? And I told her like, I don't think so. I'm really, really sick. And I ended up missing out on the opportunity, um, which I probably could have gotten if I really just put my mind to it and practiced and studied or you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and I, to this day, sometimes I think about that. And if I would have taken an internship, I could have been much further along right now. Um, and I don't ever want to repeat that. Like, so the feelings come all the time. Like, 
all the time, yeah. every day, something I have to deal with. But now my mindset is like, yeah, you're an imposter, but so what? Like, still do it, still do the thing. Um, still apply, still submit the CFP, still do whatever the whatever I'm feeling nervous about. Um, because it's better to do it and get a no than not to do it. And you could have had a yes. Like, you know, if you don't want to have that, like, like, I feel like I could have had that internship, like at a company in Philadelphia and like been much further along and all this kind of stuff. And I, I don't want to have those doubts about any other opportunity or any other position or whatever the case may be. So that's kind of what I'm where I'm at now is that, yeah, I might be faking it and I might be a fraud, but I'm still going to go for it. Like, I'm still going to go for it. And I'll let them tell me, like, you're not ready for this. And when they tell me that, I don't get really upset. I try to, like, whether it's a job or, uh, like, for a proposal for a talk, I try to ask for feedback and work with, like, work with that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, why didn't you want to hire me for this position? Oh, you didn't know get enough. Okay, well, I'm going to try to learn it now. Like, I'm going to try to get better at it now. Those are the kind of things that I, I like to uh, I try not to, of course, like things happen, you still get upset sometimes, but uh, I try to look at the feedback and take it and run with it so that the next opportunity that comes, I can be even better. But yeah, like that's the, and even now, like there are some opportunities that I have like in the works that I'm like, oh, I really shouldn't be doing this. Like there are a million and one people I can name that could do a better job at this than me, but so what? Like I'm the one who has the opportunity, so I'm going to take it. Like, and and that's, what I have to keep repeating to myself. And sometimes literally, like this is going to sound really corny and a little weird, but sometimes I would literally look in the mirror and be like, you're good at coding. Like you're you're great at Python. You're great at this, you're great at programming. And I know those aren't really true. And sometimes like if I have a technical challenge, like for an interview, I'll look in the mirror and be like, you're really good at technical challenges. Like you're so good at them. You're so good, like you do so well. On and I know that's not true, but it does wonders for my confidence for some reason. And I'll go into the interview and be like, yeah, I, I got this in the bag. And usually I don't, but still, still, it still really helps. Or even, uh, I've heard people say like, they do the, I forget what you call it, but like the, the superhero stance where you have like your hands. Oh yeah. Way. Yeah. And like, they like do that and it like improves their confidence. So those are the kind of things I do sometimes to like help. And it sounds silly, but it works. It really does work. So I would say that I haven't necessarily gotten rid of the imposter syndrome, but I've definitely changed the way I react to it, which yeah helps yeah it helps which i think you might think it's silly to do that but i think it's a brilliant way to do it and to quiet down even if it's just for one minute that voice in your head saying you shouldn't be doing this you're going to suck it uh, you're not going to get the job so just doing that to say okay that voice is going to shut up for a moment and it's going to help you so i think it's a it's a good thing to that you do that and i think it's a brilliant way to see yourself and your skills it's like yeah, sure. Maybe there's someone else better, but maybe they're not applying for it. And yeah. if you don't know something, it's what Kevin said when I had a talk with him. You can learn it. That's yeah. it. And, yeah. you know, what, uh, what did Kurt say on one of his interviews that the person said, I asked him a question and he was like, I will just Google that. I have no idea how to answer that. And they were like, huh, did they expect that? answer but <laughs> i guess that's correct <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's it <laughs> and it works like it, it works yeah. and it's okay and like honestly um i had a problem recently i was like writing an article on what was it it was something singletons in javascript and i had no mm. idea what was going on i was like i don't know what this is and i asked someone who's more senior on my team and i was like can you help me figure this code snippet out like i don't know what's happening here and he was like, I don't really know what's happening either. And that that was so validating <laughs> for me. That was like, oh my gosh, we're both confused. So it's not just me. And I feel like it's like that a lot more times than we think. There are a lot of times where people are like, I don't really know what's happening here either. And I'm just faking it. And I feel like we're all faking it and it's okay. Yep. Um. So it's not necessarily a bad thing to not know everything. That might actually be something that you can use in your favor, which again, is a ne like another thing that I look at with uh, imposter syndrome. Like, I have a, an ongoing running list of everything that I'm good at, everything. Like literally, it doesn't even matter if it's not related to tech, but like if I have a moment before I give a talk or before I'm interviewing or whatever, I'll read that list. Like I'm really good at cooking. I'm really good at like memorizing lyrics. I'm not great at singing, but I still have a great taste in music. Like I have this list of just silly things that I'm like, I'm good at this. And I use that. I am going to interrupt there. 
Everybody's a great singer in the shower. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yes. I actually yeah. agree with you. The neighbors might not like it, but we are always sound amazing when we're having a, yes. a shower and we are singing. So, you know. Yes. A little concert in the shower. What? Yep. Yes. <laughs> But yeah, I and it's and it's like a bunch of just silly stuff. Like it just and it might not even have anything to do with tech, but I have it there because it like it makes me laugh and it boosts my confidence. And then I can go into the the talk or the interview and kind of have a sense of confidence, which goes a long way. So so yeah, I have a little tricks now for for managing imposter syndrome, and it doesn't. I don't think it ever goes away. I hear people like with tons of experience who have been in the industry for years still say like, mm -hmm. I, I get it sometimes still. And I think that's okay. Um, it's just a matter of managing how you respond to it. So Definitely. And uh, I, I started my, well, I, I am a maintainer for an open source project and I had the creator of that um, project on the podcast as well. He was working, for, he works for NVIDIA and he did say sometimes I feel that I suffer the imposter syndrome and it's NVIDIA. So it's like a big company. Yeah. He clearly knows his stuff. So yeah, it's exactly what you say. We all deal with that. And, you know, even sometimes I've been a flight attendant for six and a half years. And sometimes even I'm looking at the things and I'm like, do I really know what I'm doing? And then I do an exam. We have to do like monthly exams and I pass 100%. I'm like, I guess so. I don't know. <laughs> and even then you're still like, I don't know if I did that. Was that right? Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. But it, yeah. like, I think more often than not, we really know a lot more than we think. And we Definitely. do, we're a lot better than we give ourselves credit for. Um, and sometimes like another thing too that can help, like Ask one, ask somebody in Party Corgi to hype you up or something like that. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, you guys, I'm feeling a little bit of imposter syndrome. Like, I need someone to hype me up. And sometimes people will be like, you did this and you're really good at that and you're great at this. And it'll like really help. Because sometimes like, um, it's almost like if your mom tells you you look really nice, you're like, but you're my mom. Of course you're going to tell yeah. me I look nice. <laughs> exactly. But if someone else tells you, it makes you feel a lot better. So sometimes that's how I feel too. Like, of course, I'm going to tell myself I'm good at this. It's me. Like, I'm talking to yep. myself. <laughs> but, like, if someone else tells you, it's like, oh, I must actually be good at that. I must actually be good at coding if someone else is saying it. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, you were a digital marketer and you did quite a really good um, discussion or you gave quite a lot of good, you gave a lot of good tips in Egghead about <laughs> Twitter and how to become active on Twitter and how to grow on Twitter. So I would like to ask you just a few tips for people that want to grow their presence online, especially as a junior. That's a great way for you to create your own uh, network and community. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So I would say that Twitter is probably the place where I get most of my in opportunities. And of course, like it's not a requirement for getting into tech. It's not a requirement for the tech industry at all, but it does help, especially if you mm -hmm. come from like a non-traditional background. So the things uh, I was actually, when I was a digital marketer and I was still like kind of learning how to code, I was like not active on Twitter, like at all. I just was there just because someone told me I should be. And sometimes like I was doing Twitter and social media marketing for other people. So I didn't feel like coming home and doing it for myself too. But yeah. when I lost all my clients in March, <laughs> I was like, okay, I should use this to my advantage now. So um, one thing I will say that helps a lot more than anything is like, I know people say like tweet consistently and it gets discouraging when you're tweeting consistently and no one's responding. So one thing I can say is like interact with people, like kind of tweet, treat Twitter like it's a big chat or like a big discord server where you just interact with people so sometimes that means just responding to people other people's tweets which can go a long way um and then not only like do you gain followers but you also gain like a community of people who are willing to help you when you need when you need it if you're looking for a position they're willing to like vouch for you and things like that so it's really i really have like a more com community focused view of social media than than like oh i just want to have fifty thousand followers like that is not like such a big deal to me because when you have a lot of followers then things can get messy but i think um a thing that you should really think about is community so 
interact with people. And once you start interacting with people, they'll start to follow you and they'll start to promote your content too. And they'll start to root for you. So if, if like when I have 300 followers, I'm tweeting articles that I'm writing, no one's going to see it. But once I start interacting with people who might have more followers than me and they start to follow me and they start to like, like my, like me and like my content, once they see that I'm writing an article, they'll retweet it and share it and it'll get more attention. So I think that's like the, the best thing is to kind of focus on the people, um, focus on, uh, like reaching people and reaching and building a community through Twitter. And it kind of seems weird to say that since it's such a big platform, but it has helped me a ton. And then once you kind of get like a, a following um, after a certain number, and it's different for everybody, whatever you consider that to be, uh, I do think it's good to, to be authentic and be you like, this is your platform, right? This is your space yeah. on the internet. It's even sometimes people will ask like, I'm right. I'm creating my blog. Should I include emojis or should I do this? Should I do that? And it's like, do whatever you want. Like it's your, it's literally your space. And this yeah. is the great <laughs> thing about it. You get to be you like authentically you. So that for me, that means I talk about Hamilton a lot. I tweet a lot of memes. When I write articles, I have a lot of memes in them and a lot of corny jokes. And like, that's, that's because it's me. And mm -hmm. if somebody likes it, they'll follow and they'll, they'll like still keep up with my content. And that's like the, the thing that's going to make you unique. A lot of people are like, well, it's so many people on Twitter or there's so many people writing articles about this subject, but nobody's you and you're different from everybody else. So kind of like, look at it like that, put your spin on things. And I try to be, I feel like sometimes I'm a little too, too authentic, <laughs> but I try to be like myself because this is my space. And if you are following me, I want you to get like a glimpse of what I'm like. So that's yeah, kind of exactly. what I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think that's, that's a, uh, and, and that's the kind of people I follow, like, and I enjoy it. It's entertaining to see people act like themselves and people talk about things that they like. And even if it's outside of tech, it doesn't have to all be tech either. Um, so that's what I would say. It's like community and just be authentic and be yourself um, are two things that I think really helped me a lot. And it takes time. You have to be patient. Like you're not going to get a thousand followers overnight and it's like a long game. Um, but if you put in the work and you be yourself and you build that community, you will get the the traffic and the attention that you want. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would say as well, just to add to that, um, don't do things for others expecting something in return. Just do yeah. it because you want to help others. Yes. And if you do good things, good things will follow suit and they will, um, you know, you will grow from that anyway. Yeah. Um, simple yeah, as for that. Sure. Like be nice to people <laughs> online. Yeah. Be nice to people and be helpful. And that goes a long way. Like being nice and helpful goes a long way. Cause some people are just mean for no reason. Don't be like that. Be nice. And uh, <laughs> if people are mean to you, you're allowed to do whatever you want in that case, but if, <laughs> don't be mean for no reason. Just be nice and be helpful. Um, and, and that, that's another thing that I think helps because it's so rare actually, like it's so rare for people to just be nice. Yeah. Um, so when you're, when people are nice, they take, account of that and again it's kind of a part of like building community then people will start to really like 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 you so yeah just to finish this off um if you were looking at the six year old tiora what piece of advice would you give yourself i'm sorry that's right my microphone just cut off can you hear me okay perfect perfect all right perfect awesome i couldn't hear you for a second there okay sorry about that that's all right uh, so if um, if you're looking at a 16-year-old uh, Seora, what kind of advice would you give yourself? <laughs> hmm, what would I give myself? Um, I would probably say uh, spend a lot of time with your friends because in four years, like, you'll be stuck inside and you won't be able to go out <laughs> with your friends like you want to. And travel as much as you can and learn as much as you can and keep learning languages. Yeah, that sounds. Would, yeah. That sounds a good. Um, <laughs> that sounds a, a good uh, piece of advice, or a few good piece of advices. <laughs> if uh, people want to get in contact with you, where's the best place to do so? I'm assuming it's going to be Twitter, but <laughs> uh, I'm at Ciorio underscore. So that C E E O R E O underscore. Um, my DMs are open, and I also have a contact form on my website, but like I don't ever check that, so it's best to reach me. <laughs> Better. all right awesome uh thank you so much for spending the time to speak with us and share your story and i hope you have a good day you too thanks for having me